Hi, Dennis. Hello there. Hi, Dennis. Welcome, uh, welcome with us on this um, on this show. Uh, that's basically the first the first tryout we're gonna have about live commenting uh, an overclocking competition that is actually abroad, a uh, few thousand kilometers away from us. We are we are each other like a few thousand kilometers away from each other also. But the thing is, uh, we are here to commence the GOC, the Galaxy Overclocking Carnival 2013, that is happening in Shanghai, China. Uh, Hello, with everyone. Me today, uh, Dennis, with me today, Dennis. There's a slight delay between us, but we're gonna try to make sure we can uh, we can have it uh, working all, all right. Um, Dennis is uh, editor and at NinjaLand and now at RealAsylum.com. So, Dennis, please feel free go present yourself, uh, what, what you do in your life, and why you, why you are here with us today to comment this uh, this event. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm Dennis Garcia. I run Hardware Asylum, as was mentioned. I'm also the commentator for the Ninja Lane podcast, which is now going to be renamed for the new domain. We're still mm -hmm. working on a name for that. In my free time, I am also an overclocker and currently ranked in the 20s on Hardware Bot. And I've been under the name Redmax, so you can follow me there and uh, make fun of my scores, actually. <laughs> um, that, that's good. I got news just now that uh, Massman can also join uh, this uh, this hangout. So uh, he, he might join in the next hour because he just woke up. Uh, that, that's going to be funny to have you from the US, me from Montreal, uh, the guys in Shanghai, if they manage to uh, to connect to, to this hangout, and Massman from Jebulo, directly from Taiwan. So that's truly like worldwide uh, worldwide coverage. Um, anyway, we are here today for the uh, for the GoSE 2013. Um, what happened yesterday is uh, this event by itself is today. Actually, there's three days. There's one for the pr uh, preparation, uh, the convention that was yesterday, and today is the freestyle for charity. Oops, sorry. So um, yeah, basically we're gonna go through all the different steps that we had during this day. Um, a few of us um, from the overclocking TV team uh, arrived there uh, earlier this week. They tried, they, they did some video and shooting some video that we're gonna post uh, later online, and um, we did try to do a live stream yesterday. What did happen is there was no internet connection that can uh, sustain the live broadcast to be uh, to to be uh, like completely online. So what we did is definitely to try out to do something tonight. So what we're gonna do today is to get a complete review of this event because we already know the the outcome of the competition itself, and we're gonna go presenting each of the teams and. Uh, Everything that like this. So, Dennis, do you want to introduce more about uh, what is this event by itself? Well, this event is, as we mentioned, an overclocking competition in China, and um, all of the competitors were pulled from a box, so to speak, and they were matched up not necessarily by country, by but by how they were chosen, I believe. Uh, actually, all the 20 overclockers that are attending the event uh, for these two or three days, uh, they have been invited. So it was an invitation-only event, and they wanted to make some teams. But instead of having the teams for the same country, that's uh, the team we go for the, the later competitions that, that was uh, around. Um, let's say, like, the two Korean guys uh, being together, the two um, German guys being together, stuff like this. They randomly picked all the uh, all the twenty names and they matched them in uh, in different teams. So that's for the team. We're gonna present all the teams later on today. Um, we're gonna continue now on well, what is this event? What is the goal of this event? Why why did they put that in China? And and yeah, well, what was the hardware they're gonna use and stuff like this? So how would you like to start that, Trifman? Um, so we, we kind of introduce the uh, the uh, what what happened with the uh, the teams. Um, well, um, actually, I didn't present myself, but most people know me already. I'm Truthman <laughs> from Overclocking TV. I'm the usually the guys running around trying to make sure that uh, we can get some live feed or some pictures 
and, and some live updates. Um, two of my coworkers, if we can say coworkers, because we are not really working for that, we do my co obist I would say, um, are actually in Shanghai, China, to cover this event. Uh, sadly, as I said, we can't do the real broadcast because there is uh, internet connection issues. And uh, so, what we need to know about this event and to keep in mind is. The, this event is made in China. Uh, they claim that it's one of the uh, a, a million dollar events. So basically, they want to make sure that it's a big event. If we look, uh, if we looked at the venue uh, that they uh, that they had, it's quite huge. They are they are having the Go OC, that is the Galaxy Overclocking Carnival, and they are having the GEC, that is the Galaxy Esport Carnival, at the same time. So that's going to be like overclocking on one side and uh, eSport e gaming on the other side, like uh, League of Legends and. <laughs> well, and I've seen pic I've seen pictures games. from the show floor, and they've set it up to look like an arena, similar to the way that the MOA was set up several years ago. There was banners everywhere, lots of lights, lots yeah, of actually, dramatic lights. Actually, the, uh, the 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 event we got uh, I, I got the chance to talk with uh, with Ciala and a few of the overclockers uh, later uh, earlier this day and uh, during the, during the night. Um, basically, that's a huge event, and that reminds them the uh, MSI MOA from last year, the uh, 2012. That was at NTU Sports Center in Taiwan. That was quite huge. Um, Xiala told me it's actually twice the size. Wow. Well, you that's, have two events quite. going on, so. Yeah, that makes sense to have it split up that way if there's two mm -hmm. events. Indeed. So um, for, for the event, the, there's 20 overclockers from, from pretty much all around the world, uh, may, mostly Northern Hemisphere. Um, all these guys have been selected, so it's invitation only. There's um, guys from China, guys from Germany, from France, from Finland, um, from uh, Belgium. We're gonna go through presenting all of them uh, uh, in a, in a few minutes, and uh, what we have also uh, is interesting. In the, they are using the new, uh, they, they they were supposed to use the new uh, 780 Ti, the the new graphic cards that came out a few, uh, that is supposed to come out in a, in a few weeks, and that is already out uh, for some. Um, Dennis, can you present more about the hardware? That what you think about what they're they're gonna use and stuff like this? Yeah, well. It looks like the CPU is going to be the Core i7-4770K, which has been a very popular processor platform since its inception in June. Uh, I believe the first time it was used in an overclocking competition was at Computex. And since then, it has become one of the reigning uh, choices for any overclocker looking to break records and just generally play around with a system. Uh, the motherboard was an ASRock Z87M, OC formula board. This is going to be a, a dual GPU sort of system supporting the Haswell 4770K. Graphics card, as you mentioned, is the Galaxy 78 or 780, sorry, Hall of Fame, which is Galaxy's version of a high-end overclocking video card uh, with a lot of voltage tweaks, uh, enhanced cooling. They have large uh, coolers on there as well, but I believe for this competition they'll be pulling that cooler off and putting a a GPU pot on there as well. Uh, see, memory is Corsair, four gigabytes, SSD from Galaxy, and a power supply, which is the Galaxy Hall of Fame, uh, 1200 watt. In terms of the hardware, this is actually a nice um, bench setup. Uh, the Ace Rock overclocks really well. It has a really good BIOS support. Um, Nick Shi was also one of the uh, designers and engineers to help bring this board to an overclocking level. Um, and the mm -hmm. color scheme is quite nice. You know, it's um, black on yellow, which kind of matches the Galaxy, which is a white PCB with some gold accents, which is quite nice. And Corsair memory, you know, that's it's either Corsair or G-Skill in terms of overclocking memory. And that's going to be really important for the physics portions of all these benchmarks that they're going to be running. Indeed. And there are also, do you think, the uh, new Galaxy Hall of Fame 1200 watts PSU? Um, that PSU was sent out to some of the overclockers in the past few 
weeks, I would say, like right after Computex. They were showing showing it up at Computex, and then they sent it to some overclockers. Um, with some of you might have seen uh, some of the picture online. They had uh, a dedicated name uh, directly on the PSU. And that was actually uh, quite clever to be sure that everyone's going to be using it and posting picture of it. Um, uh, about the hardware, I just have to say that the uh, 4770K went out uh, during Computex time. Uh, that was at the actually that, that was launched for uh, at the same time of the Corsair events, the Corsair Computex OC main events. That mm -hmm. was one of the biggest competition uh, this year, and. Um, as we say about the graphics, the Galaxy 7, 780 Ti Hall of Fame. So the Hall of Fame stands for the special series. So it's a custom PCB. So it's not the reference board. They use the they use the same GPU, but they use a different design for the PWM and stuff like this. Um, they were supposed to use the 780 HOF Ti for the two days for all the competitions, but they ran into some BIOS issue yesterday when they were testing. So they all switched to the 780 regular one, the 780 HOF, Hall of Fame uh, yeah. one. And that card has been out for quite a while, so it is uh, pretty mature in terms of the BIOS. So it, it's going to be the most stable platform for them. The downside is they are not going to have the extra cores, so there's not going to be a lot of records broken. Yeah, at first they were announcing that as they're going to use the TI, they will be breaking a few port records. But the thing is, with with not using the TI, they rely on better and uh, and more mature hardware. But still, they they have to to make sure that it's gonna be it's gonna be good enough to push. They won't break any world record. I don't think so. But the thing is, that's better for uh, an an overclocking competition point of view. You you run into less. Uh, issues by themselves, and uh, the the contestant can focus more on what they want to do and how they can do it better. Right, and in terms of competition, that is extremely important. We need to make sure that the system, the platform, is stable. You know, you can't be having beta drivers. You can't have reference boards that are broken. Um, everything just has to work because you really need to spend a lot of time tweaking the hardware to get the best performance and making sure that the benchmark will complete. Uh, this competition was set up to have just a block of time, which was four hours, and that's a long time to be running four benchmarks back to back, with each one having different tweaks that need to be made, different clocks that need to be set, and if you have a degradation problem or a moisture problem with your overclocking setup, then that's going to set you back and really put the pressure on to get out uh, a decent score. Especially, as you say, there's only four hours for all the benchmark. And one uh, one thing is there's only four graphical benchmarks. So there's no like 2D benchmark that you can run only on the CPU. So you have to right. take care that you use well the CPU, that you don't want to unmount all the configuration and just wait uh, to, to remount everything and start again. You, you, don't have, you don't have the chance to lose time. I think that's uh, some of the overclockers run into yesterday. Um, the, the four benchmark are uh, 3D Mark 11 Performance, 3D Mark 11 Extreme, and 3D Mark Firestrike and Firestrike Extreme. Right. As and Denise, as Denise, as you say, there is a few different tweaks for each of them. Right. And the thing to know about all of these benchmarks is that they're all DirectX 11, so they're going to weigh heavily on performance of the graphics card. In terms of the CPU performance, you can get away with not having a high CPU clock and still score really, really well. It's going to hurt you a little bit in the physics portions of the benchmark and the combined benchmarks at the very end, but it's all going to be graphics card performance. True. Um, uh, as, as we say, the event by itself happened yesterday, but then there, there's only the outcome um, uh, that was today. So they still haven't made the, uh, the awarding ceremony, per se. <laughs> So that means that they still have some. We still have a lot of time to talk about all that. Mm -hmm. um, actually, um, Dennis, what do you think about this kind of event where uh, it's it's quite difficult for all the overclockers to pick the right setup, to pick the right the right um, 
a combination of what they need to do, like do they test the CPU first without insulating the, the VGA? Do they want to test everything before? We do know that they had the time to test the day before. They had the time to test the day before the competition, but they were testing with another <laughs> car. So they had to reset and retest again overnight or at the, at the event itself. Right. Well, the way I understand it, um, during the setup for on the event day, they weren't allowed to use liquid nitrogen until afternoon, when, which is when the competition started. Um, so there is going to be a little bit of testing. <laughs> yes, the delay is a little tricky. Um, the, the layout of the event, I really like <laughs> it. Um, believe it or not, it's um, you get a block of four hours, and it's up to the overclocker to decide which order of the benchmarks they want to run. So there's no set time limit for running 3D Mark 11, for instance. Then you could, um, you know, you could start out with the one that will award you the most points because that might, if you can get a good score there, and then just kind of limp through the other ones, then you're going to have a pretty decent score. But if you concentrate on the one that doesn't give you the most points, then you have to um, work a little harder later on. But at that point, you can hope that the ever other overclockers have already posted a score so you know what you need to get. So there's a lot of strategy involved, and it really comes down to who submits a score first, um, in what order, and in terms of the benchmark, which one is going to be most demanding of the system to require a lower clock. Like, for instance, the 3D Mark 11 performance is going to require less resources than the 3D Mark Extreme. So you can run a higher GPU clock possibly on the 3D Mark 11 performance, and then you would have to dial it back for the 3D Mark Extreme. The same with the Fire Strike and whatnot. So it, wow. I really like the layout. It's a lot different than uh, like a traditional competition, like the joke. GOOC, which was the Gigabyte competition, or even MOA, where you had an hour and a half per benchmark. So you would have like the CPU benchmarks first, and then the 3D Mark ones later. So this is a little different, and I really kind of like it. Uh, one thing that is also important that um, lately in all the uh, overclocking events we can see, there are um, it, it's less and less uh, defined time for each benchmark. So uh, it, we, we're, we're seeing more and more that you have uh, like four hours, four benchmark, do your job, do, your, do the best you can do for that. Mm -hmm. um, but now on, uh, in, uh, it's like this. In the past, it was like, okay, you have two hours to do this benchmark. You have three hours to do this benchmark. And you have one hour to do this. So if you fucked up in one of these, there's no way to go back. There's no, uh, th there's no like, loophole you, you can use to... Uh, yeah, once the scores are done, then it's kind of solid at that to point. To make sure you can, you can submit all yeah. the scores, even if it's at the last minute. Hmm. Yeah, that is... Um, um, that's so that's, that's about the event, actually. Um, yeah, go on, please. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bit of a it's, delay, it's, and that's it's why kind of it's the same delay. It's, it's like... <laughs> hey, we have a few seconds here, indeed. The, the yep. thing is... Um, uh, it's, it's benching benching uh, in a live competition is not the same as benching at your home. You can do you can do benching like having your computer uh, on the side and doing some stuff and testing new frequencies how you can reach and stuff like this. But benching live, you have to be prepared and make sure that you can do like everything you want to do in the in the way you want to do. And you need to be prepared to have a backup plan. Most of the competition we see, we saw in the past, uh, some of the, uh, some of the overflickers were not prepared for it, or uh, they don't add any special, let's say, uh, strategy for it. So they end up having like two benchmark out of five they need to submit and say, oh no, but we tried to push this one and we didn't submit the other one. Uh, what we have here is none of the overclickers can be qualified if they don't. Uh, it didn't qualify. They, they can't get the total point if they don't submit all the scores. So they really need to submit all the scores to be like in the uh, in the uh, in the ranking system at the end. Right. Talking about all these overclockers, basically we're gonna introduce all of them. Um, 
uh, you can see not on the YouTube uh, hangout, but on the Twitch one, you can see on the side, like this one, there's the few uh, picture of the overclockers going on. Uh, we want to to go. Uh, that's basically the how we got the names, and we're gonna present all uh, uh, after the others. So first one, uh, Dennis, that's for you. Uh, PT1T, uh, who is he? What he did? Uh, why is he here? And what is special about him? Uh, I have some stuff to say about that. Okay. Well, you know we have a bit of notes set up here, so I'm going to just go down the line and. I'll interject when I can. Uh, see, PT1T, he's a Belgium overclocker, which is a Euro European country that speaks French and Dutch. And I believe that is also where Massman is from. Uh, it's located between France and the Netherlands. And uh, he benches for Mad Shrimps, which is a huge overclocking team in Belgium. Uh, see, previous events, he's been at the MOA 2010. And uh, he does a lot of demos around Europe. Uh, but basically, I have a few words to say about that because uh, PTNT is one of my uh, one of my friends for uh, for a while now. Um, uh, as most of you know, I was living in France, so France and Belgium. That that's pretty because that's like two hours drive depending on uh, where you live. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, PT1T is always doing um, crazy stuff. He's also he was also working for PC World France, uh, doing some um, mainboard testing for them. Basically, he has his own uh, garage at this place where he's testing stuff. He have like two setup, a cascade or a single stage that is there, so he can use that. He, he uses the Queen Nitrogen almost every week, so that's that's one of the die-hard overclockers, uh, as you can say. And he still have a nice uh, social life and still hang out, and and he used to do like uh, a famous uh, judo or some kind of fighting sport uh, champion in Belgium. So, ah. <laughs> see, sometimes overclockers can be like. Sport guy, they they are not only e athletes; they can be athletes also. Mm -hmm. um, for this event, as we say, all the overclockers were randomly picked up to make teams. So PT1T, that is that is speaking French and Dutch, is actually teaming up with a Chinese guy that is Paranoia MD. I don't know if I pronounce it right, but uh, this guy. We don't have too much information about him, but it's basically one of the uh, most important Chinese overclockers. Right, and it looks like, as you mentioned, he's not active on HardwareBot, uh, although with his ranking that he has on HardwareBot right now, or HWBot, I should probably say it correctly, um, he's currently ranked 37th in China, and he has a 7.8 gigahertz max overclock on an A10-5800K, which is the Trinity platform. It looks like he appeared for the Galaxy <laughs> GEC in 2012, and he was third runner-up in the eSports Carnival. So, so I think the the the, 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 G, the GEC was the former, almost the former name of uh, the GOC. GOC for the first time uh, called like this. The events uh, happening now in Shanghai, organized by Galaxy, um, they call it GOC to make a separation between uh, gaming esport and overclocking esport. And in the past, they also had another event that was called the GPU party or the GPU fest. And that was actually the the GOC we have now. So that that's fun to see that before that there was like mixed events and with the same name and all this. But now like overclocking and gaming are two strong communities. They are always linked together. But the thing is now uh, we can uh, we can admit that every everywhere you can have gaming, you can also have overclocking at the same time. It's not that. You always need both together. Overclocking can be by itself, but you know, you know, gamers want to to go faster, want to go, uh, want to be better and stuff like this. So why not also checking that out? Um, Splave was supposed to be there. Uh, Splave is from uh, from the U.S. Yeah, but well, actually Coast. got uh, denied. Uh, yeah, got denied by the the his visa. Uh, sadly, a USA guy is going in China is not really well uh, welcome, apparently. So <laughs> that's that's quite it. Um, Dennis, uh, I'll let you introduce a bit more this fellow over there. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've met Splave several times. He may or may not remember me, but I've met him several times. The first time was actually for an MOA qualifier in Las Vegas. Him and Rom Dominance were 
also the winners, so they were able to go to the finals, but I was able to talk to them a little bit about their setup and got to see how they set up their systems. At the time, he was uh, using a lot of kneaded eraser and some electrical tape, which was actually quite strange. Um, currently, Splave is part of the KPC Pro OC team on the Pro OC League within HW Bot. Um, he's the winner of the MOA 2012, and I believe he has gone to four different MOAs over the years, which is, um, it speaks a lot to his experience in the overclocking in terms of competitions and also just overclocking in general. He's always posting on Facebook about uh, new hardware he's getting, uh, what clocks he's been getting, and um, most recently getting a half a uh, half a tank of liquid nitrogen and then going after the company to try to get the, the rest of it that had leaked out. <laughs> that's that's actually too bad that he cannot make it. Uh, it was supposed to team to to team up with Extreme Addict. Uh, Extreme Addict is from uh, from Poland, is uh, in the United Overclockers Pro OC team. Uh, the Pro OC teams are all the overclocking teams from one to five people to compete against each other at a professional level. So that's pro overclockers, like professional overclockers. They might do it for their job, but they most of them do it for the hobby and for the uh, competition spirit. Uh, he's the number one overclocker in Poland. Uh, if if you don't know geogra geographically where Poland is, it's on uh, it's next Germany. It's it's quite between Germany and and Russia and all this uh, this country. Uh, uh, country there. It's quite cold, so they might not always need some LM2. They can do some air also if they want. But that's... Uh, I, I don't think that's going to be an issue for them. Uh, Extreme Addict has been attending uh, a lot of the a lot of the overclocking competition lately. We saw him at the AOOC 2013 this year, uh, earlier this year. That was two months ago in Russia. Um, and he was also at the uh, MSI MOA. That was over two months ago. Yeah, and I want to say that Extreme Addict is one of the more colorful overclockers that you see on the live streams every once in a while. Um, not because he wants to be, but you know he's very passionate about what he's doing, and when things kind of go a little sideways, he uh, gets a little excited. It's kind of fun to watch. He is actually a big guy, so yeah, that's interesting to watch. And actually, he's drinking a lot of beer. It's always like this. Um, th th there was a post by our OCTV crew uh, here in here in Shanghai, and they say it's already 2 a.m. Guess who's still drinking? <laughs> yeah. And you can that... be sure that he was still there. It's always like there's some some overclockers. They don't they don't prepare well if they don't drink, and it's always beer. It's never strong alcohol. It's always beer. Yeah. Well, uh, as I can attest, beer is one of those drinks that you can, if you pace yourself, you can have a nice uh, buzz going, and it will help relax you, and maybe that's something that he was after. He needed to be more relaxed so that he can concentrate on what he's doing, but, you know, I, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't say it's a bad thing to enjoy your beer, but, you know, maybe at 2 a.m. it's probably time to stop. <laughs> Uh, actually, about the, the getting uh, late at night, uh, Lucky Noob and uh, Little Boy, I think that was the two guys teaming up these, uh, for, for this overclicker, for this uh, for this event. Uh, they were still uh, testing and preparing the board until 5 a.m. They went to bed at 5 a.m. So that's, but they don't drink, they don't drink beer for, for their defense. Um, mm -hmm. So actually, yeah, that was that's quite interesting to see like how some of the guys are really dedicated to it so they can prepare all night sleep two three hours and do two days of competition and still you know uh, be social with all the other guys and and do their stuff and still perform yeah well and if it was me I would say that uh, I would probably be preparing all the way up until the event but unless I get a good six hours of sleep I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to be any good at the competition. So everybody's different and that's what makes these overclockers very unique. Indeed. Uh, let's move on to SF3D. SF3D is teaming up with Tolsti. Uh, SF3D is from Finland. That's the number one overclockers in Finland. 
uh, is for is uh, overclocking in the United Overclockers Pro OC team also. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis, why SF3D is uh, getting more and more known and more and more uh, uh, a name you can remember and you hear uh, almost everywhere when you're doing some DIY computing? I believe he makes his own LM2 containers and is now working with EK Blocks with the uh, the water block company. So that's I want to say the first time I heard of SF SF3D was when I was doing some research on LN2 evaporators, you know, some CPU pots and GPU pots, and his name kept kept coming up. So I believe that is uh, that's a good um, uh, good combination, you know, an overclocker that also builds his own containers. Yeah. So actually, yeah, he, he made the design uh, through his company SF3D OC. So basically, he made the, the design for EK Waterblocks, and EK Waterblocks is uh, building them. So that's pretty much how, uh, how it went. Um, on the pictures, uh, we can see that he's always using his pot. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's to make sure that everything is he tested. He's an overclocker. He made them. So he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Well, I hope. Yeah, well, we can hope. And there's actually one other famous overclocker who doesn't do competitions that also builds his own containers. Um, Indeed. Yeah. Mr. Vince. Yeah, Mr. Vince, Mr. Kingpin. And if we could get a, a close-up on some of the overclocking rigs at the GOC, we'll see uh, a myriad um, of different containers. We'll see some from Kingpin, we'll see some from FS3D, and we see some homegrown ones as well. There's also um, uh, Der Bauer. Uh, Der Bauer is the, a German guy that is uh, making uh, CPU and the GPU, but and a lot of a uh, lot of different. Uh, um, Actually, I use a container LM2 from him. Two gears. Yeah, yeah two <laughs> gears. I use a container from him. It's <laughs> one of the. Um, I want to say it's a limited edition because he hasn't made any more. But it was the Beast Pot. It's a very heavy, very fast container. Um, I really like it, but there's a lot of people that don't like how fast the CPU will cool down when you pour a splash of liquid nitrogen in there. Um, I happen to really like it, but everybody's different. Indeed, everyone has his own um, his own choice for when it comes to LN2 gears. Um, basically, for the most known overclockers that do a business out of that. There is uh, Vince Kingpin that is uh, actually the most uh, the most known overclockers doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, Ikea Waterblocks now in teaming up with SF3D. There's Der Bauer, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of other other overclockers like Riba and uh, um, and Stumer Winter and all these guys. They have and they they are making or they did make or they contribute to make uh, some different design about the overclocking pot. That could be for the CPU. That could be for the GPU. It's always uh, a matter of what the what is the one you you feel better with it. Yep, and it's and a lot of time. Well, these containers are also really expensive. So when you buy one, you learn how to use it. And at that point, once you are comfortable with a certain container and you've used it a while, then you know how much you need to pour to to bring it down. Um, you know how to mount it to make sure that it makes a good connection with the CPU. You know exactly how much spring pressure to put on it. It's it all comes down to just using the gear over and over again. It's you know to make a parallel. It's like a, a baseball player or a football player, and the equipment that they have, and it's the equipment that they like, and that's what they use. I think the the same happened for for gamers. They they have their own headset. They have mm -hmm. their. Uh, mouse and keyboard, and if you change that, they are not used to it, so they need the time to adapt uh, adapt back to, to be able to, to use that. I think that's the same with overclickers, but instead of, uh, we don't care about the keyboard and the mouse yet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> not yet. But we do care a lot about like what kind of CPU, what kind of batch, what kind of uh, serial number we can get and stuff like this, and all this gear also. Yeah. So who was FF or SF3D's partner? SF3's partner is Tolsty. Tolsty um, is from Ukraine, and he actually made uh, some nice show of this uh, this year. Yeah, he was in the overclocking community for a while. Uh, let's say for a few years, he attended a lot of different final, worldwide final. So he made the qualification and everything. But this year, he stand out of the crowd 
basically. Yeah. And it looks like here he was also the number two overclocker in Ukraine, and he's currently not a member of Pro OC League, which is quite uh, a change from some of these other overclockers that are um, making to the competitions. And he's currently ranked eighth out of everybody in the Extreme OC League on HWBot. Uh, what is important to say about Tolsti is he is doing that for fun, basically, like pretty much all of the others. He was attending, uh, if I can recall right, two or three World War Finals in the past five years, and he never gets in a decent position before. But this year, the 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 last two before before this GOC, that was the ASUS Open Overclocking Championship in Russia, that was the European final. He finished first, and he was also first at the MSI MOA uh, two months ago. So basically, in in two weeks' time, because the ASUS even the MSI even were like two weeks apart. He finished first on two like main events basically. So that's quite uh, like, quite interesting how these guys pushed it over the years and is is always straight to what he what he's doing. Um, I had the chance to talk with him uh, a bit at the uh, is this event at the MSI event. Basically, he prepares for something and he just do it. He goes straight to it. It's like a train going in the in the snow you you can't stop it. it's like I want to do this I'm just going to do that if it's not working I'm just gonna try keep pushing it to to go there and uh, and be sure it's uh, it's gonna be there yeah well, one uh, thing that is, that... I'll let you oh, introduce the next team because I'm gonna have some uh, special stuff to say about them okay so the next overclocker that we have is Hazan and I want to say I've met him for the very first time at Computex this year. He is a member of the KPC Pro OC number two team on the Pro OC League on HWBot, and he's located in Indonesia. Let's see, he attended a lot of overclocking events over the years. Um, he was benching for the ASUS HQ OC gathering last June after Computex. I want to mention um, during Computex there were three overclocking gatherings after the show and also during the show that. Uh, helped just average overclockers or just the, you know the community in general to get closer to the manufacturer and also use some of this gear that is just now being available at the time. So that was a lot of 4770Ks being frozen and a lot of memory being overclocked to the limit. Yeah, and uh, one, one thing is uh, Asan has been really uh, active in the overclocking community for the, for the past I would say the past five years, but the thing is, is always around here. That that's interesting. He's always pushing and all this. Um, what what is although fun to say is from Indonesia, and same as Lukinu. The thing is, Indonesia is a special market. It's um, there's a lot of new overclockers coming on. Uh, Jagat Review, that is one of the uh, biggest website in Indonesia. They organize their own. And tournaments and overclocking competitions, and they bring newcomer to uh, overclocking and then extreme overclocking. So basically, it's quite interesting to see that all the Indonesian guys, despite the limited budget, they can still compete against the the big big names. Yeah, and that's um, one thing that doesn't uh, translate too well, at least in the United States. Um, overclocking is really a, a really a hardcore hobby. And to try to get more people involved in that is it's a real challenge. So I, I applaud them for being able to pull together events and uh, bring new overclockers in and being able to uh, actually go to competitions. It, it's a very special atmosphere. Um, it, it's a little weird for me to describe that. I, I went to, to Indonesia twice for the GOSI and the uh, and the MOA, and the the, uh, the atmosphere is very like. Overwhelming, overwarming, if I could say it. It's like everyone's like so interested in that. Like, oh, how how you do that? Can you do that? Like, you, you can see that there is interest in this country to to push even more. So that's 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 fun to see that they, they have this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Azan is teaming up with Hero. Uh, Hero is one of the best overclocker in China, if not mm -hmm. the best one. Um, 
Basically, he's not competing officially in the Pro OC League. He's just ranking on the uh, Jabil Bot and benching for the Team Power Hub team. But basically, is uh, he was at the MSI MOA 2009 or 2010? I can't remember. 2009. That's when I lost my passport. So <laughs> that 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 guys are always uh, around every time there's uh, an event in China. Um, that's gonna be funny for me, Dennis. I'll let you introduce the fully European team coming next. Oh yes, well, and all the teams before this have been mixed countries, which is something we can talk about a little bit later. Let's see. The next overclocker we have is Dan Kopp. I believe I pronounced that correctly. He's from Germany. He's one of an active overclocker in the Country Cup this year, and uh, it looks like he actually made the front page at one point on HW Bot. Uh, that is. Actually. The, the thing is, Dan Kopp is, I think, the first, the best overclocker in Germany now. I need to be sure about what I say if that didn't change overnight. But the thing is, um, he made his, his, uh, the Country Cup, uh, he made a good uh, advance for Germany in the Country Cup. Basically, the Country Cup is a competition running on HWBot, and it's it's not per team. Let's say you have like gaming team and stuff like this. They are competing with within each other. But this one is about your country, the, your your country you you say you're from. So basically, you can just say, okay, I live in this country of the world, but I, I will bench for my mother, my native country, if I would say. So yep. everyone for all the country, whatever the teams you are part of, are competing in this competition, and that's. Uh, one of the, I, I would say one of the funniest competition on the bot yet, because it's always some kind of hardware and it's always some kind of uh, rules over at the same time. Uh, I'm sure, Dennis, you have a lot of uh, comment to say about this uh, uh, country cup. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, competed in the country cup a couple of times. Uh, well, contributed, I should say. Um, in the past, the United States teams have never really placed too well. They're always in the top ten, I believe. But, uh, yeah, you get these different stages, and within the stages you have hardware limitations. So you may need to have a 3D Mark 06 score using a 200 series NVIDIA GPU. It doesn't matter what kind of CPU you're using as long as it, the GPU is a 200 series. And the teams will actually reach out to people that they know that have this hardware available and say, hey, can you submit a score for us? And it's like, okay, yeah, sure. And then a couple days later, you get the system set up and actually submit a score. And all of those scores being compiled together is how the points are accumulated for that stage. So in, for the, the GPU stages, for instance, you might have the, like the 200 series, like I had mentioned. You might also have a 700 series, a 600 series, and then maybe an AMD APU, which is nobody is really going to have all of that hardware uh, sitting around to be able to bench every single one of those. So that's where you need to reach out to your teammates and also to people on other teams that you are friends with to bring those people in and actually get scores and good enough scores so that you can beat another country that is doing the exact same thing. Uh, I believe in the current Country Cup when it first started, Australia was the first country to be able to submit all of the benchmarks and all the scores and be able to have a final score basically posted. Um, within a couple of weeks, the United States team was at the top of the leaderboard. And I haven't checked lately, but I believe it's still the United States, Australia. Yeah, it's, it's always fun to see how you can be patriotic uh, when this kind of uh, competition is run. <laughs> Yeah, you can be very passionate about it, and that's where some teams that don't necessarily get along that operate in the same country can actually work together. And um, you know, it's, I, I suppose some of those teams would not compete just because they don't want to support this other team that is doing the country cup. But that is um, not the nature of this particular competition. Mm, indeed. Uh, actually, uh, I can confirm that the cup is the best overclocker in Germany. So it's uh, the best out of 2,761 uh, German Pro OC League overclocker. Uh, uh, basically, uh, he's benching for Adware Lux, 
uh, in in Germany, there's two main uh, two main teams. There's Albert Lux and PC Games Hardware. Um, uh, and basically, he made we we, talk, we did talk about the country cup because of him because he made a big jump for Germany in the ranking by submitting some of his score for the contest itself. Yeah. So his. Uh, Let's see, his uh, partner, I am going to get this really wrong, so I'm going to let you say his name. Stratigo-san. Stratigo-san. He's a member of the Pro OC League. He's a member of Clan OC in France, currently ranked 16th in the Extreme OC League, and is the number two overclocker in France. Um, the reason that I made I had Truthman mention his name is because I am no good with French names. It's horrible. And I believe you personally know him. <laughs> Actually, I I don't know where that nickname came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, uh, I met him a few a few times uh, when I was going back to France to visit my family. But the thing is, uh, these guys, I did an interview with him. I think that was like almost two years ago, and they were just building the Clan OC team. The, that that's one of the latest um, born latest born team uh, overclocking team born in France. Um, for uh, there is a bit of history in all that. In France, uh, there was a lot of overclocking team in the past, and they were all fighting with each other. Like all, it was always uh, gossip and making sure that uh, or the other one gonna get this or don't do that. At one point, everything just uh, disappeared and went flat. And at this point, some of the overclockers, the newcomer, would say, "Oh, okay, there's something. That there's no more uh, the dynamics that there was in the past." Maybe there was a lot of gossip, but there was a lot of overclocking event and overclocking um, gossip around. Like uh, it's always something happening. So they they build up a uh, clan OC, and and they were fighting to get through, like uh, having some hardware, getting sponsorship, and all this. And two years ago, when I did interview him, I did interview um, Stratigosan, and I did interview Wizardy Otto, that is uh, in the top five uh, ranking of France. And they were both saying that. Yeah, we don't know where that is going, but we want to do it. It's like we want to push as much as we can for as long as we can, and we're gonna see what happens. And this happened this year. Uh, Stratigosan went to the AOCC in um, in Russia. He finished second, and basically that's huge. That was his first live competitions. He was uh, benching with another teammate from the same team in France. And they finished second. So for the first try in a live competition, they finished in the top in the in the top three spot. That's yeah. actually quite uh, quite a good uh, uh, proof well, it, of what how, how they prepare and all that. Yeah, and it's it's uh, those first competitions, any sort of competition, overclocking or you know sports and whatnot. That first time you're on the show floor, uh, it's very nerve wracking. You definitely have to calm your nerves and keep to your strategy and that's where the planning comes in so if you've planned well and you know exactly what you're doing you can sit down and you know you might be able to take home the gold or come in silver uh, in this case I'm saying second place that is amazing let's see our, our next <laughs> uh, I have one more thing to say about these overclickers Okay. Um, if, if you look on our Facebook page, on the Overclocking TV page, or on the uh, event, the Galaxy GoC 2013 teams, that was the only guy in the bus from the hotel to the venue to have his main board in his hand and making sure that he was still insulating stuff. So basically, he continued prepared uh, like uh, at the day before and in the morning and in the bus. I had the chance to talk with him this morning uh, uh, when he just woke up, and he told me uh, uh, very briefly the event was uh, interesting. The thing is, uh, he was still preparing for the, for today. So that that's the kind of guy that wake up, take a shower, take breakfast, continue preparing his gear to to go on the to go on the uh, uh, on the event and try to perform as much as he can. Yeah. So Stratigosan from France and Dan Cup from Germany uh, are teaming up. Uh, for for this event, Tico C twenty thirty. Okay, so the uh, the next overclocker is eight pack, and I'm going to say that eight pack is not it has nothing to do with beer. Um, I believe it's <laughs> his abs. So uh, he is a member of the Pro Pro OC League, uh, OC UK Pro Team, which uh, as the name suggests, he's from the UK. Uh, 
Uh, he's currently ranked mm -hmm. first in the United Kingdom, and uh, he was also at the Corsair event at Computex, I believe. Yep, I was he was actually for... competing at the uh, Corsair OC main event, and uh, he, he was uh, actually quite interesting. That's that's the kind of guy you don't want to mess with. Is is <laughs> like he looked like a bodybuilder. I don't know what he's doing uh, officially in his real life, but he's going to the gym a lot, and you can see that. Yeah, that's um, that's the kind of shape for an overclockers you don't expect. Actually, you don't expect that from a from a geeky guy, if you can say. Oh no, and uh, I want to say when I first saw his name on HW Bot and his name moving up the rankings, you know, he was taking this very seriously. I, you know, his icon was of, I believe, his abs, which um, I thought was a joke. I didn't think that uh, you know a bodybuilder would be overclocking, but it turns out that it worked for him, and now he's ranked first in the United Kingdom. Actually, yeah, um, he is he is one of the um, uh, I, I would say most known overclockers in the United Kingdom. Uh, although he is making videos, he made the promotional videos for Overclockers UK. Yeah, and that video is really so, quite good. We should uh, you should seek it out and and watch it. It's quite good. Yeah. Let's see, his teammate uh, well, is well made and yeah. yeah. So, should we go on to his teammate? Uh-oh, lost you. Sure, 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 his teammate. Yeah, okay. We, ha we have another delay problem. So, uh, Stephen Young, I believe that is uh, pronounced correctly. He is located in the UK, or Hong Kong, not the UK. A uh, former UK nation, I should say, um, and he has a very thin HW bot profile. It appears that he overclocks, but he doesn't actually submit scores, at least to be ranked on HW bot. Okay. Truthman and I are talking offline now. Let's see, the next overclocker on the list is... I think we're going to lose him again. Okay, just go for the old corn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Zolkorn, um, I had the opportunity to meet him at Computex, and uh, we had this little running gag every once in a while when we would make a turn and see each other again, we would just kind of laugh. It was kind of funny. But uh, he is a member of the Pro OC League. He's associated with Overclock Zone, which is a review site, I believe, or a hardware-related site located in Thailand. Uh, he has an 8.2 gigahertz CPU validation using an 8-core FX8350 AMD CPU, which is um, quite amazing. It's uh, one of those CPUs that you can run without a cold bug, so you fill it up a uh, full pot of liquid nitrogen and basically run it as cold as you possibly can and try to get the most speed. Um, I also want to mention he's famous for wearing a red hat. Uh, you see some of his overclock zone videos, and he always has a red hat on. At every overclocking it competition, same red hat. OC Winforce is also a member of the Pro OC League, uh, member of the NP2 Korea Pro OC team located in Korea. He's currently ranked the number one overclocker in Korea and has also an 8.1 gigahertz CPU Z validation on the FX8350. Ah, it appears that the Twitch stream has gone down, but we're online on YouTube. Yep. That's good. Do we have Mr. Aspen joining us? Um, it will be soon, but I need to uh, make sure it's going to be working fine. So okay. let's continue and let's see until you arrive. All right. Uh, 
I'm going to have to have you say the next overclocker's name. Shimizu? OC Windforce? Ah, no, Shimizu, I... Shimizu, sorry. Uh, I, I was missing the uh, OC Windforce part. Um, ah. Shimizu, 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 I would say. Yeah, I believe I that's that correct. Easy. I don't think he's going to beat it us beat us up too much for missing that. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's actually new to HWBot. Uh, he's currently ranked 20th in Japan and is also paired up with uh, Matusi? Matusi. The Romanian yeah. guy. Yeah, he's from Romania. Pro OC team member and the winner of the MOA 2009 and 2010. Okay. And it's currently associated with Lab 501 RO, which is also located in Romania. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry for that. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, actually, uh... Yeah, Romania. He was he was supposed to um, to team up with Monstro. He always team up with Monstro. Actually, that's the thing. Uh, yeah. The Romanian team is always Matose and Monstro. But for now, for this one, uh, he's teaming up with uh, Shimizu from Japan. Um, yeah. One thing about uh, one thing about Matose and actually um, uh, Monstro. Uh, Matose won the Go OC 2010, the last Go OC that ever happened the Gigabyte Open Overclocking Championship. Mm -hmm. He was benching alone, but Monstru was always his teammate. For, they're, they're in the same team, they always did all that. Monstru was almost crying when Matose wins, so that, that's the kind of friendship you can see that they were both really into it to make sure that it's, uh, it's going to happen. Yeah, and that's really important for an overclocking team. You need to have passion for what you're doing. You need to be actually really good friends, know how everybody benches, you know, each other benches. Um, and actually, you know, and the closer you are, the, the better and more successful you will be. Which, as the winners of the MOA in 2009 and 2010, that's, that speaks a lot. Let's see, the, the next team uh, member we have is Little Boy, Pro OC member, uh, also benches for NP2 Korea Pro OC team and he's currently ranked number two in Korea. And I believe he also won the MOA in 2012, correct? Yep, indeed. Uh, he was the, the, he won the, he won the overclocking, uh, MSI overclocking arena uh, with his teammates, uh, OC Winforce. OC Winforce and Little Boy are always mentioned together. Uh, yep. They're really nice guys, and I have to say that um, Korean guys don't speak that much Chinese usually. But these guys, the first time we saw them, they 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 was with the, the traditor, and in the last in the last few events we met them, they were speaking English. So I have <laughs> to say that it's a it's a strong improvement, and I'm pretty sure that all that come all the with the way that they got qualified for all these uh, overclocking events and uh, all these uh, new new kind of competition, if we would say. Yeah, I believe in 2012 they had an interpreter on the stage well during the award ceremony, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So in terms of a uh, highlight for Little Boy, he currently has a 7.9 gigahertz CPU validation using an A10-6800K, which is the, the mid-range AMD processor. Also has no cold bug. So... The, the important thing for benching those is that you have really, really good insulation, which is really important in the subtropical region of Korea and Taiwan and a lot of those Asian countries. Indeed. Let's see. His uh, teammate is Lucky Noob. He's a Pro OC League member. He's also associated with JagatReview.com and currently ranked first in Indonesia. Uh, a little tidbit about him is he always has a small anime figure with him every time he benches. Um, I'm trying to get Massman on the call. Sorry, I, I got distracted. The um, uh, Lucky Noob is always is always smiling. I never saw these guys not smiling at the and an overclocking competition. Even if there's like a lot of issues or stuff like this, they are always uh, they. You can see that they're dedicated to that. Um, I remember you have uh, an anecdote about uh, these guys 
uh, back in the Computex time at the MSI, uh, MSI HU benchmarking events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the mascot's a uh, little anime figure. And um, it was actually uh, and, one of those things that was more interesting to talk about than some of the hardware that they were benching. Yeah. Sure, go on. Oh, no, well, that, that was pretty much it. <laughs> I believe it was um, <laughs> one of the, the MSI uh, sales engineers, I believe, was uh, talking about how he was always scared of anime, but it turns out that he just saw the really scary um, fringe anime that's not necessarily a cartoon, but not necessarily something you should watch either. So, um, <laughs> Uh, that's the nice thing about cartoons is that you have a, a wide variety of um, different styles to choose from. Some are a little friendlier than others. Indeed. So um, the, shall you... The next team? Yeah, next team, which is the last team. It's 800 Pro and Smoke. Yeah, 800 Pro and Smoke. Uh, he attended the MSI MLA 2009 the worldwide final in Beijing, right? As a yeah. well-known mm -hmm. Chinese overclocker. Uh, he doesn't have an HW bot profile, but that is not uncommon for the Chinese overclockers. Um, it's either the, the great firewall or um, just no desire. Let's see, his teammate is Smoke. Smoke is actually a very famous overclocker from Russia. Um, he's a member of the Pro OC League. He benches with the RC or OCLab.ru and is currently ranked number two in Russia. That's a, a little fancy tidbit about him is that he has an 8.1 gigahertz CPU validation using the FX8150, which um, is no small feat as well. Um, who did Smoke always bench with at the MOA? Was it Slams? Uh, slams, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, that was that was in the past, but it's not anymore. No, not not so much anymore. <laughs> so those are our overclockers. Uh, yeah. So that's all the overclockers. The twenty overclockers competing in uh, in these two days competition. Um, back to the competition itself. The first day was competitions, but who won? Who won? We actually know who won that. Ah yes. And drum roll. Drum roll, you can do it. I will do it. Yep, you will do it. <laughs> the winner is Hassan and his teammate. I forgot the name, sorry. Hassan and Hero from China. Do we uh, do we know what the final scores were for all of the overclockers? Uh, yep, I can send you the link right now. Uh, the, the fact is, they didn't add... Um, uh, a live scoreboard uh, as we expect. So that was like a, a web page being updated and updated every time. Mm -hmm. But the final score, uh, we can check that. Just give me a minute to find it back. Yes, that's although my internet's being the issue here. <laughs> it's good to blend the internet. It's always internet fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see. I think you sent me the link earlier. Let me look. Uh, no. Actually, uh, I, although I had the opportunity to talk with him this morning, uh, this morning for him, it's, it was actually evening for me. Um, when he woke up, it, uh, I told him, like, congratulation, guy, uh, that's well done. And um, what what do you say that it was only based, uh, it was only about luck? Because what happened is when he won that, he went back to the hotel and went straight on Facebook and say, that is, um, the exact term is, that is mostly luck. Oh, that was just luck. Mm. And uh, the the thing is, I, I asked him, why do you say that? Say, oh well, um, that's because I got uh, I got nice hardware and everything went well. No, not not so many issue, and it managed that it happened to to have the, the correct stuff. It told me it was benching the 780 at 1800 almost. Oh wow, that's actually really impressive. Yeah. You want something more impressive? It didn't do any VMOD on the card. Ah. Uh, well, and I want to say that at past overclocking competitions that I've watched, um, of course, you sometimes have to 
do the the bolt mod on the card or on the motherboard just to make sure that it will um, give you the voltage that you're after. But with these modern cards that have enhanced VRMs and voltage controls, a lot of times if you hard mod the card, it gives you less performance than if you just use the tools that you were provided and either do a software mod or um, you know use the the little plugins as you know depending on what card it is. So. I'm going to say by keeping the hardware intact, that was probably the one thing that saved him um, from, well, propelled him actually to become the winner. Actually, that's exactly what he told me. He told me, uh, no mod, I just flashed the BIOS. With the mod, we'll get so many problems. Yep. That, that's straight from what, from, from what you say to me. Um, so basically, that's the one of the, uh, of the allies. He did... Um, he said that if I don't mod, I know I won't run into so many issues like tuning the right set, right uh, voltage and so on. So maybe that was a good choice. You finish first. Yeah. So while you are actually pulling up the scoreboard, if you can, I'm going to go back and actually yeah. talk a little bit more about the benchmarks and the way that the point system was set up. Uh, they had four four benchmarks. We had the 3D Mark 11 Performance, 3D Mark 11 Extreme, the Fire Strike, and also Fire Strike Extreme. And then the way that they broke them down was we have a 35% point way on 3D Mark 11 Performance, which out of all these benchmarks is probably the one with the least amount of demand on your system in terms of overclocking. The next one on the list was 3D Mark 11 Extreme with 25% weight. Next one would be Fire Strike, which is the less uh, demanding of the Fire Strike benchmarks, and that's at 22%. And coming in last would be Fire Strike Extreme at 18%. Now, this is um, a little strange to me because, for instance, on HWBot, when you are submitting scores for points, 3D Mark 11 performance is the one that will give you points. And 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme is also the one that will give you points. And those in this particular competition are at different ends of the spectrum in terms of what points were awarded. So for instance, the winner or the person that ranked with the highest score in 3D Mark 11 performance would get 35 points, and it scales down to the number 10 spot. Um, mm -hmm. three mark uh, extremes, 25 for the winner and in previous competitions we've seen where these points just accumulate and then you'll get a final score at the very very end and it looks like I have a link here so let me pull this up real quick and that's the scoreboard so um, first team is as an end hero and uh, as you said about the benchmark uh, the second team is little boy and lucky noob Actually, Little Boy and Lucky Doop secured the second spot like a, uh, an hour and a half after the beginning of the competition itself. So an hour and a half after it was um, it was started, they they run into the uh, the benchmark, they run all the four benchmarks, submit those scores, and just kept improving that after and after and after. Yeah. So basically, they improved their three mark even performance score uh, for almost almost two thousand points. From the first one they submit. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the scores right now, and it looks like Zolkorn and OC Windforce had the highest 3 Mark 11 performance score at 18,390 to win the 35 points. But then, in overall, they became in third place. Um, yeah, it looks like number two spot in 3 Mark 11 Extreme, same with Fire Strike and uh, Fire Strike Extreme. Actually, they got the same amount of points all the way across the board there. Uh, although I am incorrect in saying that it was actually sixth place. Six, five, and four, respectively. Hazan and Hiro had a second place in 3D Mark 11 performance, and then in 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme, they had second place. So those two things combined were really what gave them their number one ranking. So do you see anything on the scoreboard that... The, uh, the, the thing is... Uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, basically the Junior Mark 11 performance score of uh, 18k from Zorkon and the Windforce is still quite far from the 21k bot records that is actually uh, on HWBot. And that mm -hmm. is the HWBot is the reference uh, every time you want to check for a world record. It's always easy to claim that you have one, but unless it's ranked, it's ranked and uh, displayed publicly online and posted online on HWBot, it is not a world record. That's basically what you have to say. Um, that's interesting to point that out because today, uh, the, the second day of the Galaxy Overclocking Carnival, basically they, uh, they, they say every world record that's going to be broken, uh, every top scores, stuff like this, we're going to give money to charity instead of giving money to the overclockers itself. But um, that's also a trick uh, maybe they use to be sure that uh, no other competitors will post a higher score than them just to, to break the PR. Right. Well, and um, it's their competition, so they can tweak the rules however which way they want. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of HWBot, that's one way to check for a world record. You can also look on, since these are all FutureMark benchmarks, you could look on FutureMark itself and see what the score was. And I believe that even at 18,000, that's way beyond whatever the record was at, at um, FutureMark as well. Um, one thing that I'm looking at here is that just about everybody has, um, they're within, you know, 80 to 100 points of each other in terms of all of the benchmarks all the way across. Um, so all of these scores uh, had about the same clock speed, the same GPU speed. Um, so there was just some minor things and some minor efficiencies that were really separating any of these people. That, that is actually uh, interesting because that means all the hardware was pretty close in performances. And mm -hmm. that's also interesting to see that um, uh, the... Uh, oops, sorry, I, I, I lose my words when I speak. Um, <laughs> it, it was interesting to see that it was close in the hardware and what makes the difference is the, the tweaking and the few different steps you can get into it. Right. Yeah, the, in terms of, um, you know, really, I'm looking at Zolkorn and OC Windforce, and I'm seeing an amazing score in comparison to all of the other scores that were submitted. It would be really interesting to also see, you know, what order they had submitted their, their scores. Like, for instance, was 3D Mark 11 Performance the first one that they had submitted, or was it the last one that they submitted? Um, based on the number, I'm going to assume it probably was the last one, and uh, they just saw that everybody had 1,700, and they knew if they needed to to get ranked, they need to have more than that. So they would just run it over and over and over again until they got the score that they were after. Um, that's something that we won't be able to see because we weren't there personally, but uh, I guess we could probably ask him. Let's see, in terms of some of the other scores I'm just seeing here, sure, we, we have... We could ask them. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, we have... I'm really surprised with Extreme Addict and Duon. I, was, I believe that is uh, spelled correctly or said correctly. Um, from the information I got, from the information I got from the, uh, from the location, from the events, um, mm -hmm. I think they, they were having issue about communication. You know, uh, one is from Poland, the other one was supposed to be split, that has been replaced by the other guy, the other yep. Chinese guy. Mm -hmm. And I bet that none of them can really understand each other. Overclocking right. language is still the same. You know that you want to raise the FSB, it's still, it's still the URH to FSB. Actually, FSB doesn't exist anymore, but if you want to raise the vCore, you raise the vCore. You can point out on the screen and say, oh, I want this, or I want that, or just go, yeah. or go up. But you cannot argue with someone that don't speak the same language as you. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to... Uh, there, I'm going to assume there was a language barrier with a lot of these overclockers, um, especially not necessarily language in terms of the way you're speaking, but also in the language of how you overclock. Everybody has a different formula that they use, and I'm going to assume that Extreme Addict had, um, had probably got a little excited at some point or another, but um, he may like to step up in terms of the way he overclocks, being able to run a benchmark for a little while and then raise the clock and then restart it. Um, or, you know, he might have actually followed a different method, but the problem with putting overclockers that have never worked together 
on the same team, they um, their overclocking methodologies will often conflict, and they really have to get over that if they really want to win. Um, considering that Zolkorn and OC Windforce were from similar countries, um, mm -hmm. I believe that you know, and they probably both spoke English quite well, so they could actually communicate. Actually, actually, I could say that Zolkorn speak English okay, and OC Windforce just speak English like he speak English pretty well. The thing is, uh, that's one of the Korean guy that two three years ago didn't speak any word of English, so. Oh, yeah. I, I think it. I think you can understand each other, and I'm pretty sure they have the a similar way to do uh, overclocking also. Yeah. Well, and let's face it. With uh, Haswell, there's very little that you need to to know. It's in terms of getting the right voltage and making sure that that matches your multiplier and your base clock. Um, if you're not doing any 2D benchmarks, you don't have to worry about the the motherboard and the subsystem as much as overclocking the video card. And in terms of the GTX, the NVIDIA brand, you know, you have a, a power target that you're after, you also have um, voltage to the core, and you really have to make sure that the temperature is within the range that the GPU and the memory like. And I believe we had uh, a report from the show saying that the cards were kind of cold bugging at a strange temperature, is that right? Um, I heard that, but I can't remember the details. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I believe it was. Uh, they were cold bugging at negative 80 C, which is um, a, a really strange temperature to actually have a cold bug on their memory. Um, it also limits how fast that you can actually push the GPU. So you can put in 1.5 volts, but you're not going to be able to get the card um, cold enough to be able to use that voltage. So it's really going to limit your actual overclock. Um, now, since Hazan did not do any hard mods on his card, he might have been able to bring the card down lower and not have that same limitation. That's true. And that, that was maybe the trick he used, and that's why, uh, um, that's why he, wanted, he didn't want it to use any mod at all, I think. Um, uh, I, I think we, we, we will continue on that a bit later. I have a few uh, chronological uh, say uh, submission of the scores. So uh, after the 40, first 45 minutes in the competitions, anyone can submit any score they want. But everyone, almost everyone, went went to see the 3D Mark 11 performance score first. Mm -hmm. And basically, X800 Pro and Smokes submitted uh, 1700 uh, 17k points. Uh, I think that's still. That is still the, 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 the point they had at the end. 1,700, 315. Uh, oh, no, they just improved it by 500 points. Yeah. Um, so basically, X100 Pro and Smoke, Shimizu and Matose, sf 2 d and Tolsti, PT1T and Paranite AMD, they all submitted the scores uh, before the first hours in 3D Mark 11 uh, performance. The only team at that time that did at the time to submit two scores was Chimizu and Matose. Um, they did submit the Trademark 11 Extreme uh, scores at the same time. Ah. So after an hour and a half, basically uh, only these five, uh, four teams actually, it's only uh, it's only four teams did submit a score, and then after that, all the other teams just start like pushing, 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 and. As you as you can as you can maybe guess, Azan and OC Windforce didn't have any scores at that time, so they were maybe trying to get something running, run all uh, like 3D Mark 11, and then get something running for uh, 3D Mark uh, and Fire Strike Extreme. Run this one, submit, and then go back to the first one. Continue. Um, I don't know. I don't really know what was the um, strategy for that. I think they went for 3D Mark 11 first, pushed as much as they can, and then 3D Mark Fire Strike and Fire Strike Extreme pushed as much as they can, because yeah. it's not the same weight on uh, each benchmark. Oh no! And that was uh, the one thing that I found interesting about um, the competition in general. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I uh, lag again. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's 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 the bit of the the delay is although it's a bit tricky. Um, one thing is Shimizu and Matose they, they were the first team they were the first team to submit all the benchmark 
in uh, in the in the first uh, few hours. So that was the first thing to complete all the four benchmark. Uh, sadly, they finished six. So maybe they run into some issue. I don't. We don't know yet from uh, from here. They got uh, the second or third best score in 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme. They got a decent score in 3D Mark Fire Strike. They got, I think, the third one also. And uh, 3D Mark uh, 11 performance, they were a bit uh, a, a bit lower. The thing is, they were the first team to submit all the benchmark. So uh, if, if you look at the scoreboard over time, Basically, they were like, oh, OK, this team has no scores at all. So let's say Azan and Hero. At, at the time when um, Shimizu and Matoze submit all the scores, Azan and Hero didn't have any scores yet. So that's quite interesting to see that maybe they push a bit more to tweak and submit only best scores. But I think that Shimizu and Matoze went for for being the um, the... the uh, the, the secure plan. They say you we submit everything, so we are sure we have scores to, yeah. to be ranked. In and the end, all the teams submit all the benchmarks, so that's fine. Yeah, and the um, you can kind of contrast that with uh, a more traditional overclocking competition that we've seen before, where you have a certain time limit, so you have to get your score submitted within a certain time limit, and then at that point, it locks your score in. Whereas with a competition like this that's actually open, you can choose which one you want to run. You can choose to submit them all, you know, just run them uh, with safe settings and make sure that you have scores on the board. Or you can um, tweak and tune and make sure that you get the best score or what you're expecting in each benchmark before you move on to the next one. Um, and I, I think that that's one thing I really like about the layout, but I also believe that... Um, some of the overclockers that have attended competitions before don't necessarily like. They, they want to have a little bit more structure where you have a set stage saying, okay, well, this is what you're running. Okay, now change to this one. So that way they can tweak and tune for that benchmark during that time frame and uh, submit scores as they're going along. Yeah. The, the thing is that's, uh, as we talked a bit uh, earlier in this uh, in this in this in this live, uh, basically the, uh, the 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 way the competition are made, we are switching, we are we are sliding from this is the defined time for each benchmark, so you have to make sure your strategy fit to that. To uh, you have four hours, four benchmark, do your job. So yeah. it's basically you you give more, uh, you give all the overclockers more chance to arrange for a strategy, but you also give them more choice to take. So they have to take action to be sure that they can do something and go on. Mm -hmm. So let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, I'm trying to get Massman on the call, but I can't manage to do it. Oh, is he, uh, well, it is the weekend there. He may uh, may still be sleeping. No, 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 he is here and so on. It's just that I cannot add him on the, on the live. Oh. It's like add people to this call, but I, I cannot add them, so. Oh. We, uh, Poor you, Mass Man. Poor you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a few notes uh, about uh, the event itself. Um, uh, as we said, the overclockers arrive uh, not for the day of the convention. They arrive one or two days before. Uh, as we said uh, earlier, Splave didn't make it. Uh, for uh, it's it's because he got uh, his visa denied. Uh, sorry for him. Um, SF 3D had a flight issue, and the last news we we heard before he arrived in uh, in Shanghai was he was boarding a plane to Beijing, but late and no news from that. It's like I might not make it. I'm just boarding a plane to Beijing. It's like okay, why not? <laughs> Um, he, fin he finally arrived uh, in Shanghai late afternoon, so I think by the end or just after the uh, the pre-testing, the day before the competitions. Um, as we said earlier, there's n they don't use anymore the G4780 Ti because of uh, BIOS issues, and they they are all using the 780 Hall of Fame, so that is the previous one basically. And also, the Korean guy didn't have time to prepare and attend the uh, modification, uh, let's say a tutorial or um, a talk with the uh, engineers to be sure that, okay, this is the right VMOD, this is how you do it, this is the, the BIOS, and so on. 
um, because they had a, a flight issue also. That's that's interesting to see that uh, with this kind of events, you fly uh, over the world basically 20 overclockers to compete on computing parts on, on computers for this kind of event. So that's a lot of budget only for the flight and so on. It's a lot of budget for the event itself. So mm -hmm. that's how we see that overclocking did become something important. It's been a, it's been five six years now that there's like world competitions, but having that every year, not only in terms of the event itself, sometimes they even scale down, but for the better, and the the, the way that, that means that there is more. Uh, there's getting more viewership, there's getting more interest, and there's more marketing advantage also in doing that. Um, I think, Dennis, we, we can speak a bit about uh, the overclocking history. Basically, 10 years ago, there was nothing about overclocking. There was overclocking, a lot of overclockers doing stuff, but that was mainly garage overclocking, I would say. Right. Well, the, the overclocking in the early days was out of need for the most part. So, for instance, you have a brand new game that you want to play. Um, for me, it was Quake and Quake 2. I didn't necessarily have the hardware I needed to get the best frame rates out of that game, so I looked towards overclocking. So I was able to raise the CPU clock a few frames, or a few megahertz, I should say, and I could get a few more frames in my game. That is really where overclocking started in its roots, and then when people figured out, oh, hey, this is what we can do with our hardware, how far can we take this? And that's where extreme overclocking started. So, you know, you had people tweaking the, the, the timing chips on the motherboard to actually raise the front side bus. And you had to do that at the hardware level because it wasn't a BIOS option where you go in and actually raise the front side, front side bus or change the multiplier. Um, some of my old AMD boards, they had jumpers on the board. So you would have uh, like a, a K62 processor. You could put that on there and you were supposed to set the jumpers to the frequency of that chip. Well, it turns out that you could actually say, well, this is actually this chip, even though it's not, and get a free overclock out of that. Um, Intel started to catch on to that partially because there would be uh, companies that would buy low-end CPUs and then rebrand them as a higher-end CPU and then people would sell or buy them based off of that and it was not exactly what they had bought. So um, that's when overclocking started to not be so much modifying the hardware but being supported by the manufacturer, something that they would build into the BIOS to take advantage of a CPU that is now actually locked by Intel. Yeah, and that's, that's also one of the issues that um, Intel is taking back all the control inside the CPU. And uh, so that's, that's what happened with some special analog BIOS that can unlock some special features on CPUs. Uh, so that's, that's basically now uh, a kind of software on the hardware side. So basically the, the CPU itself can control the PWM, all this, and if they want to lock it, they can do it. I don't think that's worth it for them, but if they want to say, oh, no, we can't do that anymore, it's just too bad you don't have the control anymore on this. Um, but you, you can't, we can't really say anything about that as uh, Intel is in the um, dominating position on the performance side. side. Um, I do personally like and prefer overclocking AMD, AMD gears, uh, just a personal point of view for that, just because I can fill up the, fill up the LN2 bot and just don't take care anymore about that and just read the voltage and all that stuff. It's, it's just easier to explain when you're doing a live, uh, live explanation and live event. But yeah. yeah. You know, after the years and after the years, we, we get more and more and more. Uh, let's say the P5B from Asus, like f 10 years ago, was like barely, you can overclock it well, but you have to modify a lot of things and you can burn things pretty well. Now, we have like the X87 OC from Gigabyte. It's like everything is on it. You, you don't have anything to do anymore. You don't have to, to mod. You don't have to, to be, it's like you just get the BIOS right end of the story. You can you can burn anything you want, you just go as much as you want. Sometimes you still want to do some tweaks, but the thing is, is there. Before that, there was no no hardware made for overclocking, and nowadays it's like pretty much all the high-end motherboards have that. 
Yeah. Well, and also from the manufacturing standpoint, in the early days, um, early days being maybe five years ago, uh, the manufacturers were grouping gaming and overclocking together because they saw those two activities as being the same thing. Over, overclocking is done to better your gaming performance. Now we're seeing manufacturers uh, release hardware that is designed for overclocking explicitly and also having gaming specific products as well. The gaming ones are ones that have enhanced sound, um, enhanced cooling, and maybe a few overclocking bits added to them as well. Um, the overclocking eccentric ones are designed for extreme overclocking or for multiple GPU configurations. Uh, like the, the Gigabyte OC board that you just talked about. This is the, the fourth generation of an OC board that they've released designed specifically for that. Um, I still remember with the X58, the, a sales presentation from Gigabyte, and they were trying to figure out how to market this particular board, and they were marketing it to overclockers in general, and that was the main reason for the board. But they also figured that this would be a nice trim down inexpensive motherboard that could go into a data center. Uh, it didn't have enhanced onboard sound. It didn't have, well, I believe it had an Intel uh, network, so it'd have good throughput in and out. It had a very, very strong uh, VRM on board and very high quality components. And these are designed to last an extremely long time. In the hands of an overclocker, you want to have cleaner power, so that's why I use these higher uh, components. And that's also when it went into the Galaxy um, Hall of Fame boards. And not necessarily the boards, but the video cards. They have a larger VRM to supply more power to the GPU. They have voltage controls built in. As Hazan done, he went and flashed a, a new BIOS onto the card and was able to unlock it to the point where he could get these massive scores in this overclocking competition. And I believe we also have a picture of uh, the white PCB, and they covered it in liquid electrical tape and turned it black, which I thought was kind of fun. Yeah, well, I, I, I will find it. On, it's on our uh, Facebook account. So basically, a um, lot of overclockers were asking, and that that's was a request for a long time, to have white PCB. Why white PCB? Just because it was cool at the time. And the mm -hmm. thing is, uh, white PCB have some issues. White PCB turn yellowish under extreme cold, and when you 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 burn them to, to warm up, so that's why most of the uh, of the of the manufacturers didn't pick that. And there's also another issue is that it's um, more difficult for the RMA center. But that was in the same magnitude of having a black PCB. Uh, basically, everyone is doing black PCB uh, nowadays. When in the past we had like gray, uh, weird green, and some uh, weird colors uh, PCB. Mm -hmm. Some fancy light blue and, <laughs> and well, so, I, but nowadays you can, nowadays you can't even find a board that is uh, a main board that is not even like black PCB. Now and a lot of those uh, alternate colors like I still have a gold and a purple board in my armada of uh, old hardware, and I talked to the manufacturer about that. Why don't you do gold and silver? All these strange colors, and it turns out that they are extremely toxic as well. So a lot of these. Um, companies that supply the PCB to the manufacturer so they can build a board, they, they do so so that they are environmentally friendly, so to speak. And that's why we see a lot of black ones. Uh, the matte black or the gloss black. Uh, Gigabyte went with the matte black early on, and that was because it showed water better, which is also important for extreme overclocking. You know, you want to know where your water is hiding, if it's underneath the, the VRM or in the socket or something like that. I found the, the the pictures we were talking about uh, earlier. I'm just gonna display. I cannot display it on YouTube. I will display it on on, on the Twitch TV, uh, mm. on the Twitch channel. Mm. If I can find it back. <laughs> I had it and I lost it. There it is. So basically, they had the white PCB and they put uh, rubber tape that is black on it. So it's like uh, I just <laughs> I said on the overclocking TV uh, Facebook slide. Give the overclockers what they want, white PCB, and they turn it back again. <laughs> well, and there was uh, several comments uh, when that picture first went live. Um, uh, some people didn't know exactly what was on the board. They thought it was like tar or something like that. And 
you know, it was actually black electrical tape, uh, liquid electrical tape. And this yeah. is, it brushes on very similar to rubber cement, and it just dries into this uh, solid plastic that you can peel off when you're done. Works really well if you have a, a video card that you want to use after you're overclocked, after you've done your overclocking session. Um, if you put Vaseline on the board, uh, it's very difficult to remove and it's uh, really sticky. And the, the electric, electrical tape is uh, a little bit cleaner. Uh, it also is easier to apply than if you did a uh, kneaded eraser, which is the other popular insulating material. And I've, uh, I've used those. I prefer the red myself, but I'm partial to the color red, so I always pick the red color. I do actually use the kneaded eraser, but that's just because of um, it's easier to to show to show how it's made and not being too weird. Um, the the thing is, there's always you know controversy on on what is the best insulation. Uh, basically, it depends how you bench. Uh, I know some people just don't like kneaded eraser because it conduct it, it's conducting the heat. So basically, it's conducting the cold, the heat and cold. Uh, and, uh, so if you get the pod rate too cold, like th that's gonna spread a lot on the main board. Some other uh, some overclockers, especially in the um, very humid country, like in Indonesia and all that in Taiwan, they use Vaseline. They use Vaseline a lot. So you put Vaseline everywhere on the main board on on the graphic cards, just to be sure that there's no water going down. Uh, one thing that it's a bit tricky it's um, when when you s the water is uh, when the ice start melting and become water. It it stay on it stayed on the on the on the level of Vaseline, but at that point you still need to to get it out out in one way. Mm -hmm. And Vaseline is uh, is also you have to clean it after, so you have to, to dry it as much as you can to be sure you can reuse it without having all your hand with Vaseline every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah you... Actually, actually, it's quite it's it's quite funny in in Taiwan when uh, there is competition, you always see like. Five, eight guys going to the first 7-Eleven buying Vaseline. It's like, ee, that's weird, but yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it makes a lot of sense in the humid countries where you want to make sure that everything is guarded against water. Uh, where I happen to live in Bench, it's uh, what they call the high desert, and during the summer, the humidity here is like 10%, 20% at most, and in a lot of cases, I can just put down paper towels and uh, that would be my insulating method because there's not enough water to condensate on the motherboard or in the video card. That that's actually one of the uh, one of the tricks. Like whatever the kind of insulation you use, you always need a toilet paper or any kind of paper to absorb all the humidity. I, I mean, all the ice melting down. Like all the humidity is like um, icing and then melting down in water. Um, that's uh, actually, I know we can we, we could we could speak for like two hours just about insulation, like what kind of insulation you should do <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, and uh, uh, Massman had a good uh, I can't remember if it was Massman or Neo that that was making the editorial on the overclickers, the magazine, and mm -hmm. he was saying that you you can ask all the overclickers. Uh, I think that was at MOA. You can ask all the overclickers. They will all give you a different answer. There's there's no there is no miracle in that. You, you always have to try, be sure, and use what you feel more comfortable with. It's the same as the CPU and GPU board design. Which one do you like the most? It's an investment, so just be sure you use the right one. Yeah, and um, you know, bringing that back to the GOC, we don't necessarily know exactly what over uh, insulation method they used, but at this point, you have overclockers from different parts of the world having different insulation techniques and. By the looks of it, we didn't have any catastrophic hardware failure, so whatever insulation method they used uh, must have worked. But uh... well, that's that's the thing. I mean, always when you go to this kind of event, you I remember that was uh, I think it was GoC 2010. There was uh, Mike Mike Waba, the US guy. He was uh, submerging his platform completely. So basically, it was putting his main board. Into uh, uh, dielectric grease, so that's basically like liquid that doesn't conduct electricity, and he was bridging into that. So it didn't need any kind of uh, insulation; just uh, just throw the thing in the in the water, and the freezing point is so low that it was still okay. 
But the thing is, every time you have to change something on the board, you have to put out everything, replace, try a bit, put stuff everywhere. So it's it's not it's just a matter of how you you, you are used to uh, to do that. Right. Yeah, and that kind of an overclocking method is only good until the liquid gets um, dirty. So yep. like just dust from the air, or you know, if you drop a little bit of water in there, or something like that. Um, you know, frost falling off of the, the GPU pot will have particles from the air embedded into it. So that's going to get into your fluid, and at that point, it's um, it could become electrically conductive. But for a quick and dirty overclocking method, that actually works quite well. And there's actually case modders, you know, system builders that have done a very similar thing, where they take a clear case and they fill it up with this uh, mineral oil, which is you know inert to electricity. And they, they don't have any heat sinks on it. They just have uh, pumps and jets pushing this cold liquid over top of the hot chips to keep it cool. Works quite well. Well, about the uh, the GoSE, um, let, let's go back to to the main point of this of, of this slide. Um, the the GoSE, the Galaxy Overclocking Carnival, is uh, happening in Shanghai, China. Um, we, we are not able to provide you the live feature from there uh, because of internet issues. We would we would have loved to do it, but we will make uh, like an after movie and uh, and recompile all the information we did give you in this uh, in this live chat with Dennis. Uh, uh, this mixed with some of the the videos from there later on. Um, basically, the first uh, the first day. Uh, we call it day zero, so that's the day before the competitions. They were all uh, having uh, a testing about the new hardware. So basically, what was the, uh, the the settings for the graphic cards? If they want to do vault mods, uh, all the engineers were there to to be sure that it's doing right and everything is okay. Uh, the day one, that is the competition itself, is a competition. That was a competitions. So at after four hours of Intense benching. The, uh, the the ranking was out. There was ten teams of two overclockers, so that's twenty overclockers from all around the world. Um, the first team that is Asan and Hero, Asan from Indonesia and Hero from China, uh, won three thousand USD. Uh, the second team is Little Boy and Lucky Noob. Little Boy is from Korea and Lucky Noob is from Indonesia. They won two thousand USD. Uh, by being the, the second in the, this four benchmark that was used. And the third team is Zolkorn and OC Windforce. So Zolkorn from Indonesia, uh, sorry, Thailand, and OC Windforce from Korea. So actually, if you look at that, Team Korea managed to be in the two uh, top three spots. Yeah, that's actually really impressive. Um, I also noticed that all of these are Asian-based overclockers for the most part. Nobody from Europe was able to uh, place high enough on the rankings, and uh, there wasn't anybody from the Southern Hemisphere also represented. But that could have been part of just the, the lucky draw and the fact that they weren't picked. Yeah, indeed. Uh, another thing is um, if, if you say that's mostly in Asian, Asian countries that won today, the fact is the year before, the first few years, like, um, 2007, 2008, 2009, and 2010, that was only European countries winning. Uh, 20, 2011, I can't remember who won the, the 2011. And 2012 was the Asian year. So pretty much <laughs> all the uh, commission were won by Asian people. And this year, 2013, it's Eastern Europe year, if I would say, because... Mm -hmm. um, Put out some of the uh, show of competitions. The MOA and ASUS OOC that was told still that when he's from Ukraine, so that's that's one of the Eastern European. Um, that's you can see that there was like few part of the wars depending on what kind of hardware and what kind of support they can get. Um, but I think that 2014, uh, 2014 that's going to be all mixed. I don't think there's going to be any kind of country that's 10 out because everything going to be so high level that everyone going to be pushing the last bit at the at the very like um, like any kind of 
small impact going to have impact on the ranking after. Yeah. And a lot of that comes down to the way that the competition is organized and the way that the uh, points are divvied up based on the overclock, um, benchmark and the overclock. And it would be really interesting to see how in 2014 that changes or what stays and what actually gets changed. Um, and if there's actually kind of a, an overriding uh, design of an overclocking competition and how it's, it's arranged and, and the points are uh, worded. Yeah, indeed. We will see. 2014 is going to be very interesting. I, I really like 2013, how things turn out. So we moved from something that was made only uh, as overclocking for uh, just nerds, let's say, like only uh, hardcore user and hardcore overclockers. And there was this point where this was about to slow down and just start again with new guys that have not, not exactly the same mindset and they want to push more. And all the, tri the, the work that uh, Massman is doing with the step buddy bot, all the work uh, we are doing at Overclocking TV, all the work that all the other websites are doing, uh, like Hugh Dennis with Ninja Lane and uh, Agri Asylum now, uh, on the podcast, the video podcast, the way you, you did um, cover the MOA qualification, for example, stuff like this. It's, it's getting another kind of attention. I think we are... Not, we can't compare in terms of uh, about to enter the change that or oh, they can become pro over pro gaming. And I think we are at the start of this this change for for rock clicking. So I think that 20, 2014 can be very interesting. Yeah, for, definitely. For that. Yeah, Oops. I am. Um, I'm looking forward to. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, you're back. Yeah, I'm looking forward to 2014 and uh, how it's going to change and. I'm also looking forward to the changes in the hardware from the manufacturer, how that is going to be enhanced or if, it, if there's any new innovations that are being brought to, to the table and, and how the boards are going to be segmented and the video cards are going to be segmented because we have right now a clear division between gaming and overclocking, but there's different kinds of overclocking. There's also different kinds of gaming. And as they start to diversify or... Um, consolidate their product lines, that will have a huge impact on how overclockers actually use that gear to break world records or compete in competitions like this. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I think that's that's going to be it for, uh, for this live. Um, Dennis, do you have anything to add before we say the bye-bye the words? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want to congratulate all of the winners for the, the Galaxy Overclocking Carnival, and uh, I hope to see them familiar faces again at the various trade shows and also the new overclocking competitions. Um, I also urge anybody listening to this that wants to learn a little bit more about overclocking and gaming in general to visit the, my website and uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can hear a lot more and drop in some questions, and I, uh, I get guests on every once in a while, and we'll probably have Truthman and Messman on as well. Yeah, actually, uh, if you want to see uh, what every everything that Denise was talking about, you can go to ninjaline.com or adwareasylum.com. Uh, I think I pronounced it right. And, <laughs> and we would like to uh, actually Denise, me, a uh, massman that was uh, on uh, on the text chat with us, but not being able to go online for some weird reason we don't know. We want. I want to personally congratulate all the overclockers that. Uh, did come like make it happen for for this uh, for this event uh, that fight uh, that fight there. The thing is, um, we wish to be able to do the, more this kind of coverage uh, with more information, more screenshots, more uh, more insights, inside news. Uh, let's say that all the guys, what happened before, what happened after, what happened during the competition. We, we hope that you guys like it. Um, for everyone that is watching that, we want to thank you. That was our first try to make something live. Uh, it was a bit tricky for us. Um, uh, for Mainly for the internet and stuff like this. Uh, um, do hope that we can do that again. I'm sure. Last time. I want to say thank you for 
all, all this. I want to thank you, Dennis, for being there uh, with us and uh, making this, uh, this thing happen, this, uh, this take talk happen. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. And I also want to uh, welcome. Um, we will see you maybe uh, next time for another kind of uh, another overclicking competition. Don't forget, watch overclicking TV and keep pushing it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>